Welcome back to Le French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT. And we're going to be joined as well by an Englishman who's got a fair few stories to tell and a lot of insight to offer on French rugby, having played in all three of the top divisions in France during his career, as well as the Premiership in England. So we'll get him on shortly. But you're back, Johnny. You had a week off the podcast for the first time ever. Lazy. We just about coped without you. But from the various messages and voice notes and phone calls we've exchanged. Did you wish you were here? Did you miss us? Because it doesn't sound great. Yes and no. <laughs> Mate, I, I, I had a great holiday. Um, Health-wise, it wasn't the best. Um, I can't remember if I mentioned on you that I was crook like two weeks ago. We um, hinted at it, I think, yeah. <laughs> working for BT Sport. And then essentially the night before, we were driving up to the Dordogne and then Santa Emilion for some wine tasting. The night before we we left our our middle our, our middle child our girl obviously caught the same bug so she started throwing up and we're like oh let's just go we'll get in the car the next day and hopefully she'll battle through it so bless her popped her in the car got about an hour up the road and then elder starts chucking his lungs up as well <laughs> so it was carnage from start to finish we had a difficult first 48 hours let's just say but after that beautiful region uh door Dorn's great i'd be up there um, and campsites as a kid so it was great to go back and revisit with my kids um and health wise everyone was healthy by the time we left now my missus has come down with it as well so she's in a bit of a state um so it was messy but mate great to get away great to have a change of scene uh, the kids absolutely loved it once they were past the the sick bug um and what a part of the world the wine tasting Santa Emilion is absolutely stunning um taking the kids for walks around Doydown River I mean it was beautiful a beautiful time to get away it was great pros and cons bit of wine bit of vomit <laughs> <laughs> exactly a nice mix normally it doesn't go to that normally it's too much wine then the vomit comes after but this time the vomit came first so it was a purge to start um and it got better as as the holiday went on so it was great fun in the end and partly because of that but for various reasons we're coming to you a couple of days later than usual as a one-off this week so we're not gonna spend too much time looking back or chatting about the top 14 but Toulon did beat Toulouse as they continue their remarkable charge having been rock bottom what only seven rounds ago which is incredible so do you think they'll make the playoffs and I put Benji on the spot last week so it's only fair who's making the barrage well the crazy thing is you had like Murad Bujalal the ex-president coming out and knifing them and saying that he didn't even think they had the, the players to stay up they were going to get relegated so I'm delighted for the playing squad I'm delighted for the coaching staff that it's worked out James Coughlin's down there as well he's been on the pod good man so I'm delighted they've turned it around do they have enough to make the top six I don't know you asked me before to jot down what I thought the interesting thing is now you've got an incredible game of only three games left only three rounds left of games but now this year you've got eight sides that can aim for Europe there's loads more to fight for so teams are going to be scrapping out right to the end that's going to be the interesting bit but when you look at the run and some teams have more of a favorable run than others um, I think that Montpellier and Bordeaux, I think Bordeaux will finish top. I think they've got a more favourable run than Montpellier. Um, I've got them to finish on 79. Um, I think Montpellier will be second. I think potentially Cast could match them. I think that could be tight. Like Cast have got a run where they could go and win. They're, they're away to Beers this weekend. That could be five points straight off the bat. So they're in a situation where they potentially could run Montpellier close for second spot and then it's really tight like I, again I've got I've got Racing to finish I, I think they just tip it with some of their fixtures they've got um but Toulon, Bordeaux, La Rochelle between them like fourth fifth and sixth seventh eighth potentially are all going to finish within one or two points so like I would say your first second for me and third are nailed down then between them you've got I would say La Rochelle and Racing finishing fourth and fifth. And then sixth spot is you've got either Toulouse, potentially Lyon, Toulon and Clermont have got a really favourable last three games as well. So that last sixth spot is going to be a chip in a chair to who knows what. We've seen Cast win it from six. We've seen Stade Francais win it from six in the past decade. So make a headline for us then. Toulouse are going to miss out, are they? <laughs> I mean, you've seen crazier things happen. They could go on and win the Champions Cup, but... Are they going to qualify when they have to back it up in the Champions Cup as well? You just don't know. There's a chance you're going to have to put some boys on rest and they're not going to stick out their first string on one of their fixtures at least. So, I don't know. Again, their first one this weekend is at home to La Rochelle. 
who've got a point to prove, La Rochelle, who've lost them in the past two finals that they've played against each other. So La Rochelle will go down there all guns blazing. Um, potentially, Tim, yeah. Um, if they can pick themselves up and win a breathe, they might win back some points. But the, the last game is against Biritz, where they'll pick up five. So they're going to be there or thereabouts, but they're going to have to pretty much win every single game. I'm not sure you answered the question. <laughs> Who's finished <laughs> six? <laughs> I have no idea, mate. It could go any way. That six spot can go any way for ways. Um, going to have to push you, Johnny. <laughs> I'm, for the story, I'm going to go too long. Okay. Purely because of where they've come from um, and how bad it's been at times. It must have been horrendous. Um, this weekend, I think they'll lose at Bordeaux, um, but I think they'll beat Poe in the penultimate round. And then the last round is a way to Racing. Um, and I see that as a 50-50 as well on a hard deck, a dry deck, a closed roof. And when you've got the players back in the calibre of team now that Toulon can stick out, you never know what can happen. So um, I'm going to go Toulon to just pip that six spot. And it might have been a good few days ago now, but if people haven't seen it, there's definitely at least one bit of action from the top 14 that we should highlight before we move on. So loads. can you fill us in? Meet a moment of the week time? <laughs> there was loads. Um and actually, this is the hardest meter moment of the week that I've had to pick. Um, but there was Teddy Thomas finishing for Racing. Right. An absolute, he's a freak show, man. The, the way he runs, it's so effortless. I wish that was how I looked when I ran. <laughs> and clearly now jogging now, I look like somebody should just put me down. Um, Teddy Thomas was absolutely phenomenal the way he finished off. Turnover ball from multi-phase ball. Um, incredible athlete. One that I absolutely loved as well was the Bordeaux try. So Louis Picamol, King Louis Picamol for his last appearance at Montpellier. Bit of footwork and offload and setting up Max Lamotte for what can only be one of the best front row, but if not hooker tries that we're ever going to see. Um, but again, maybe it's my Toulon bias coming back in, but part of that insane performance by Toulon and the win over Toulouse at the weekend was the individual performance of Gabin Villier. And you've got levels... But this boy is just a freak show, whether it's Toulon, whether it's France, he's just immense. Um, and it starts with a lovely show of the ball, holding up a defence by Louis Carbonel, some great hands and interplay between Paris and Lacafia. But the quality of the finish by Villiers batting off Max Medar and Tolofu after a monstrous day at the office for him was my metre moment of the weekend. He was absolutely phenomenal. There we go. That was Johnny's metre moment of the week. And metre is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer recently making over 11 million cooks better with their game-changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan, and you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, we're up the stakes recently, and you can get 20% off any full price item instead of 10%. All you have to do is enter the code FRENCHPOD20 at checkout. That's FRENCHPOD20 instead of FRENCHPOD10, and you get 20% off any full price item at meter.com. And you may have been away on holiday, Johnny, but you're still beavering away on the beach or in the Dordogne or wherever you were. And we've got a new sponsor, haven't we? Uh, not any old sponsor either. We don't just throw this thing together. It's a bit like finding the perfect halfback combination. They've got to complement one another. So have we got the Antoine Dupont and Roman Entomac of sponsors here? Who's the new sponsor, Johnny? Barbecue and beer, mate. There's no better combination. Uh, we're getting towards summer. Meter have got us covered, making sure our barbecue game is on point and your all-around cooking needs are sorted. So what we did need and what we do have now is a few beers to go with it. And Day's Brewery are hooking us up. Um, and I first came across their beer at Scotland, France during the Six Nations at the back of a rucksack or duffel bag. I'm not sure if I should share that information, but <laughs> absolutely mate, top drawer beer. I absolutely love it. And we're lucky to have them on board. We are. Yep. Day's is a new breed of alcohol-free beer created for those who want to do more. Proudly brewed in Johnny's native Scotland, using locally sourced ingredients, their beers are 0.0% ABV and low calorie. And they're now a B Corp certified company committing 2% of all sales to charities that empower fresh thinking towards mental health. Brewed for good times, good days and good tomorrows, you can enjoy all the great moments associated with a cold beer, just without the side effects. And with over 700 five-star reviews, it tastes great too. Whether it's sitting on the sofa watching rugby or out at a summer barbecue, Days is a beer for all occasions. So just head over to daysbrewing.com and use the code RugbyPass15 to get 15% off a case. 
Let's get our guest on now then and head to the Pyrenees to speak to an Englishman who's in the top 14 now after spending the last couple of seasons in the Premiership. But it isn't just the top flight of French rugby he knows all about, having done his time in the second and third tiers in France as well. Poe Fly Half, Zach Henry joins us. How are you doing? I'm good, mate. How are you? We're good. We will come on to all the interesting stuff that Johnny is desperate to talk about from your time in the top three divisions in France shortly. But we best start with the present and Poe. I think you might be mathematically still in the shakeup to make the top six if you win big in the last three games. But how disappointing was that narrow defeat to Stade Francais? Yeah, it was. I mean, we were livid for that. We, I think we we focused on that game. I think with top 14, it's a long old season and it's easy to sort of get lost in the season. But we really looked at the Stade Francais away game and we were like, that's a game we really want to aim for. And we just, honestly, it was, I don't know if you guys watched it, but it was just a messy game. It was balls were dropped everywhere. It was a scrappy. lot of they're scrappy. And with my, me and myself, I've come back from a three-month injury and I don't think, like, we just, we, it didn't really click. Um, so we're very disappointed, but we've got Racing home this weekend, so we've got a good weekend to bounce back on. And even if the playoffs are out of reach, qualifying for Champions Cup rugby would be huge for Poe. So... Is that still something you're talking about? Do you feel like it's still within your grasp if you win this weekend? 100%. I think we've, we've spoken a lot about just focusing on each game as it comes because we sort of got to the stage where we realised relegation, like we're not really going to get relegated, so we've got to start looking up rather than down. And I think we thought, right, let's just take it game by game and see how high we can climb. But I think everyone, we're a motivated group. We've got a new, I think at the start of the year, there was 15, 17 new signings new staff and everything we're all motivated and we all want to go as high as we can so it's definitely something we're looking at but I think we just take it game by game and if we can beat Racing at home this weekend that'll be a massive one. How was it settling in Poe when you moved from Leicester because you got there a bit late didn't you because of visa issues and then yeah. you won the club's player of the month award in September and October so you hit the ground running so it started well despite the hiccups and does that mean you've sort of said to everyone I don't need to turn up to pre-season next year. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what it is? I mean, I won't, we won't, we're not here to talk about Brexit, but obviously Brexit butchered my, my pre-season because there was visa problems. I had to get my dog over as well and that had its own problem. So I was like three or four weeks late to pre-season, which was beautiful because I missed the fitness test and all that sort of stuff. But um, I feel like because of the training I'd done at Leicester and sort of the intensity of what that was, coming into Poe in top 14 where the training's maybe a bit more relaxed I think people can I think we can safely say I sort of it was probably the easiest transition I've ever had I sort of came in the book I mean it helped it was a new group as well so it wasn't like there was a stable group and everyone knew each other it's sort of like everyone was trying to work out who everyone was and what's going on and how we play and stuff and I sort of slotted in and played I think my first nine games I went 10 fullback 10 fullback 10 fullback 10 fullback and it just felt like a really easy transition there's the culture at this club is unbelievable. Like everyone, everyone's so nice. Everyone, I think it's always been known that way. You guys know top 14. I think Poe's always been known as the nice club and it just made the transition really easy, honestly. The way you talk about the transition and the fitness makes me scared for another man that's just signed for Leicester. So James Cronin, I bumped into the, the Beeritz prop and he was just like, I'm shitting my pants. <laughs> Going from Beeritz to Leicester in the preseason that's waiting for him. He's scared already. I've never done it. Like it was, so we had Alid Waters who had just come off the back of winning the World Cup with South Africa. And then we've got Leicester who are obviously trying to climb back up the league. You've got Steve Borthwick coming in who obviously wants to impose himself and has done so brilliantly. And it was just, it was a recipe for disaster for me because I came from Pro D2 where the training's chill. We do four weeks on, one week off. Um, I was, I thought I was in good shape. Turns out I was not in the slightest. <laughs> And I tore my hamstring, actually. Like I, I think the training was just too much for me. I tore my hammy, but it was, it was COVID as well. So we couldn't really like do much, too much rugby. It was just like, we all had our own lane on the pitch. And it was like, run, hit a tackle, shield, get back up, run, run, run. It was, it was savage. And then coming to this preseason, it felt a lot easier. Yeah, it was. So good luck to you, mate. <laughs> so you tore your hammy when you went to Leicester. And then when you came back to Paul, you tore your quad, did you not? Yeah, I had a shocker there. So <laughs> it's weird because... Over the last three, I look at my last three years and I think I've barely been injured because that was, I told my hammy I was out for two, three weeks in pre-season, but I ended up playing 26 games for Leicester and not getting injured throughout that period. And then here, I think the training's so different. I think my body probably didn't handle it. Like you spend a lot of time on the pitch in France, you know, as well as I do, like in Leicester, it was, 
sort of you get out, you train really intense and you get back in. And out here we can we can be on the pitch two hours, two and a half hours. There was one, there was an infamous day before I tore my quad where I was on the pitch for three hours straight doing like all this sort of stuff. So I tore my quad and then I came back and then did my hammy straight off the back of that. So I ended up spending three, two and a half, three months out. So before you tore your quad as well, let's back, let's go back to the start of the season because you start so well. Tim mentioned there a few player of the month awards. Um, you start at 10, you beat him on Pelier, then start from say you're up against Nico Sanchez and Loa Mappe. Like given from where you'd come from and the different levels of rugby you'd played at previously, how big was that for you? Those those were massive for me, those few games there, because I think I spent my whole career trying to get to the top division. And I think I I got there with Leicester. And although I loved my time there, it just wasn't for me. Like the way they play. I saw I signed for Geordie Murphy and a whole different coaching staff and a whole new, a whole different sort of set of pretenses. And then Steve came in and it was so difficult. So I was happy to be at the top division, but I look back on it and it was a battle every week. It was really, really tough for me personally, like the way I play and what I'd come from. And then to come to top 14 and then sort of be able to play how I wanted to play. And so I was at the top level, but playing how I wanted to play. I was actually really enjoying it and like living in the moment and sort of in the stadiums, really present, really enjoying it. I think those were probably some of the happiest games of my careers. And we do mainly want to talk about your time in France and and Pau and some of the clubs you were at before you went to Leicester. But just touching on that there, at Tigers, the change from Geordie Murphy to Steve Borthwick. Obviously, we've seen how well they're doing this season, but we know how intense he is. So was it just a case of, you mentioned how many games you played, so he clearly liked you for, for a while. Was it just that kind of you felt that your style and Leicester style didn't quite fit, or, or what was it? You know what it was, I think, is like, I've everyone that was at Leicester that year, most, not everyone, you can't generalise, but most boys that were at Leicester that, that year, they've, They've come through that academy system, not Leicester, but they've come through the Prem Academy system. They've been moulded in a certain way. And I went, I didn't, I went to uni. I sort of, all my, all my friends off the pitch, they're not rugby guys. I went to Fed One. It was, Fed One was three weeks on, one week off. Pro D2 was four weeks on, one week off. The training was, there was no structure whatsoever. At Nevers, it was like, just go out and play and same as Ruan. And then I get to Leicester and I knew from day one that Leicester were going to be successful the way Steve spoke to everyone the way he the training with him and Alad I knew I said to all my mates I said like there's no way this club won't get back to where it is but to try and at the age of 25 26 try and learn all of that in one year like the whole sort of in that in that in the premiership in general I think but also in Leicester is like everywhere on the pitch you knew what you were meant to do and the detail on like rucks kick chase box kicks my kicking everything was insane and then I've come from Pro D2 and Fed 1 and Uni where there's like, you're just playing rugby. You're just looking at, oh, there's space over there. I'll run over there and I'll run over here. So like, he he obviously put confidence in me. I played a lot of rugby and I was, I was buzzing with how it went, but I just know, I don't think it was going to be sustainable for me to get the best out of myself. And I'm buzzing for the boys. I'm still mates with a lot of those boys and I'm buzzing for them and I'm happy to have been part of the project. But I think for my personal career it wouldn't have been best to, to stay there sounds quite clearly you know where you're happier mate um and obviously <laughs> you got out of your contract one year early to get back to france and get back into the top 14 which is massive um yeah. but that was with poe so what was it about poe it's not a club that gets massive headlines or a lot of airtime um in french press or, or world press but can you give us a little bit of insight into you mentioned before a little bit of the culture but what's it like behind the scenes the people the environment how it's run um, what is Section Palois really like? Well, do you know what's mad is, like you said, is Poe for some Poe's been in the top fourteen for years. They've done under well. the radar. Under the radar, they've had seasons where they've done really well. They've had seasons where they've just maintained. But there's teams like Beeritz and Bayon, as you know, who like get way more publicity, but they've actually been worse than Poe over the years. And it's a weird one. When I said, I remember there was a few boys that left. I said I've signed for Poe, and they said I was at Pro D two or top fourteen. They didn't even know. And, for me, honestly, it's the the word to describe it is nice. Like all the fans are nice, all the people are nice, everyone that runs the business is nice, everyone that lives in the city is nice. Like it's the most stress-free thing I've ever seen. But the the counter argument to that is we can be too nice. Like when you want rugby players to kill off a game or you want to be a bit ruthless or you want to be sometimes we we miss that a little bit. Um, but honestly, the driving in every morning, you're like buzzing to get to the training ground. And, the chat between the boys is fantastic. There's no, 
I think it's normal for sports teams to have cliques or have little groups because people drift towards one another. But here, honestly, between the foreigners, you've got the Islanders, you've got Aussie boys, English boys, Irish boys, French boys, you've got all sorts, Georgian lads. There's no divide. Like everyone, I could, you could be having coffee with one lad or another, or it's it's pretty amazing to see that. So, yeah, it's just a very nice club. <laughs> so no scrapping, mauling with your tops off on a Tuesday. Sounds like you need to bring some Leicester to play, no? <laughs> Mate, there's been no scrap. I've been shocked. After, honestly, the way I see rugby after two years in Leicester and then coming here and boys are like helping each other off the ground after a bit of, bit of like a rough tackling training or whatever. And, but I think we're trying to move further towards a bit of anger, a bit of aggression, a bit of whatever, a bit of ruthlessness, but without losing the culture that we've got. You need to get Richard Cockle in, mate. He'll sort that out. <laughs> he'll sort it out some great stories of cockers from edinburgh they absolutely loved it loved um it. Yeah. so mate the, the man that's led the charge so Mannix and co have left the scene a lot of the foreign influence has gone the big money that's been there from total their big sponsor has been reduced massively but with a mainstay now of a french squad and a french coach can you tell us a little bit about picciaronis who's former under 20s coach now head coach with poe you guys look like you have a solid foundation, solid game plan. You look happy playing together. Can you give us a little bit of insight on the coaching side, the structures, how it works behind the scenes and what he's like as a man? Yeah, I think often with French coaches, the worry, especially for people that grow up in the English system, is they're going to be very emotional. I'm sure you've come across a very emotional. No, <laughs> never. <laughs> um, they'll lose their rack. Like It's very results-based. So like you win and they think you're the best team in the world. You lose and they think you're the worst team in the world. And it's just... It's kind of, but Seb is honestly, he's like the most neutral, calm guy, really like manages boys well, really good communicator. We have conversations all the time, got a good sort of leaders group of young French lads who sort of still bright eyed and sort of want to want to take this club somewhere special. So for me, I think I had good uh, Zoom calls with him before I signed and I sort of, I believed in, in what he was saying. And he's, I mean, he's contracted for three years, got this year and two more, I think, and he's talking about taking the club sort of to these Champions Cup spots. And I genuinely believe he can do it. I think under the radar is a good place to be. And he's sort of come in and he's, even from the start of the year, from pre-season to now, I see how we're working better, spending less time on the pitch, sort of training more intense. And we've got some good S&C coach and stuff like that. So it's, it's going in the right direction. And I've, I've, got, I've got confidence in him. And you mentioned you had Zoom calls with him before you got there. Johnny mentioned you had a year left to run on your Leicester deal. So how did the move come about did you, did you sort of go looking for it did he come to you how did it work I sort of spoke to Steve and I think the writing was on the wall I think it was like unsaid but I think he knew and I knew that things weren't clicking and I'd, I'd probably find it difficult here and they would be better off with, with someone else that probably suits their style a bit more so when I had my conversation with him I think it was quite like open and quite like yeah we both sort of know it's in our bet it's in both interests and I think they wanted to free up the spot for Freddie Burns anyway um so I think it just suited and then I obviously spoke to my agent and he I I said look I'm, I'm happy the Prem has been brilliant this year and I've got nothing against the Prem and I would still play in the Prem but I think we both know for now with where I've come from it's like France probably suits me better and I speak French so then that like is it coming in as a fly half to certain teams they if you can't speak French they might find it difficult but they're knowing that I speak French I think they'd sort of be set that was one of the first things that Seb liked was like you can slot straight in and speak to the French boys and the English boys and the conversations were quite simple we spoke to two or three other clubs in France and just what Seb was saying and what the club sort of where they situated themselves it made the most sense so it was it was a relatively easy transition it wasn't there was no hostility between me and Leicester there was no nothing too too dark it was quite quite an easy transition so I'm now interested to talk about the first move because the top 14 stuff's boring, mate. I want to get right back to basics and the start of your journey because Federal won and how you ended up there. Um, you're from Brighton. You studied at Bath Uni, overlooked at certain points for academies in the UK. So how on earth did you end up playing for Rouen in Federal <laughs> One as a youngster under Richard Hill? Like, how did that come about? It was unbelievable. I look back on it now and I, I'm like, why did I... That was crazy. But um, I, was, I was at Bath Uni and I... I wanted to give pro rugby a shot. And I was sort of people were saying to me, like, you could go pro. And then other people were saying, like, nah, mate, don't even bother your rubbish. And then my brother, mate, you're gonna name me. Now you've made mate. Me. You're gonna name me. <laughs> yeah, I don't speak to these boys anymore. Um, 
But my brother actually, shout out to my brother because he did his whole career in the championship and bless him, love him to bits. And he was my motivation, but he sort of showed me what not to do. And we, we talked about this a lot. And he was slogging out in the championship and I sort of thought, right, going to the championship isn't something that I want to do. I think there's, I didn't see it as an opportunity. I got, I had like one conversation with Cornish Pirates and they offered me, I think like six grand for the year or something like that to be third choice 10 and slog it out down there. And then Richard Hill, who was obviously at Rouen, knew my coach at Bath Uni. And he had said to him, I think that, oh, I'm looking for a 10 to just come out as like a, just a, like have a shot, a one shot 10, just have a year and come for an experience. And I just was like, do you know what? I'll, I'll give it a go because I didn't know much about French rugby. I didn't, didn't know what was really what to expect. And funnily enough, my family, like a lot of them said, don't do it. This is stupid. Like, what are you doing? And I went out there and I was meant to go for one year. And obviously I stayed in France for four years after that. And the minute I, I remember Googling Rouen on Google, obviously, and like the only photos that came up was like two posts in a field with like a dog on it. <laughs> and I remember my mum was like, what are you doing? This is a shocker. But I ended up going and great, great group of boys. And we ended up having a really successful year. We had Gabin Villiers, who's now playing for the French team. We had Wilfred Hunkpatan, who's at Cast. He's played for the French team. We had Tom R. Scott played in the Prem. Martin Roberts, who was at Exeter before. Jan Thomas, who's in Bristol. And, a lot of these boys. So we actually ended up having a really good team. We ended up winning Fed One that year, which was unbelievable. We might come on to Gabon Villiers in a minute, but just a word on Richard Hill, because he was at Rouen for ages. But before that, in England, he had a bit of a mixed reputation. He divided opinion quite a lot. But for you, obviously, he gave you that shot. How did you find him as a coach? I've got, honestly, I've not got a bad word to say about him. I've got so much love for him. He was he was unbelievable with us. Um, it was my first taste of professional rugby as well. So I hadn't experienced like high level and then had to come back and train with Ruan. But for me, he gave me opportunity. He helped me so much, like helped me progress. I'm only here because he put me on. Um, and even like, I don't know if you've seen any of the photos or anything, but I've sort of maybe two, three months into my Rouen gig, I lost my front 40, broke my jaw, had like a horrible experience. And even through that, he like really helped me out the other side of that. And so, yeah, I've got, I know there's there's some people say some stuff, but I've, I've got nothing but good stuff to say about him. He's a legend. He paid for your false teeth. Endurance. <laughs> they're, they're real as well. They, uh, they picked them up off the field. They were on the pitch. They were out of my mouth for like 10 hours, put them in a milk bottle, 12 hour bus journey from Oleron to Rouen and they put them back in on the other side. How did they get knocked out? Is the obvious question. Uh, head on head collision. Oh, brutal. Um, I'd also heard because a lot of boys that I played with had then dropped down the divisions and ended up at Rouen and they said, fantastic time, very little training, barbecues, beers, team runs and games. They absolutely loved it. So what was it like in terms of, again, you've mentioned going up a level at Leicester, was that as cruisy as it can get at Rouen? Was it absolutely amazing? It was, it was unbelievable. It was, I still, I felt like I was still at uni, but it was mad. Because fed one, what you get in fed one is you've got 48 teams. And obviously in the third division in England or even in the championship, you don't get half of what you're playing random teams that I've never heard of. San John de Luz, Banier de Bigor, like teams like this. And you're getting big crowds and they're there with their bands and they're hurling abuse at you. So I was like, this is unbelievable. I mean, this third division, like, and boys are getting paid all right and there's big stadiums. So I felt like a pro rugby player, but yeah, it was kind of off the pitch. There was, there was a lot going on. There was, I don't know if you read Ben Mercer's book, but he talks a lot about it. And um, we were, what was cool is you would often stay over as well. So if we played San John de Luz down on the beach, played like teams near Toulouse or whatever, we would always stay over and then obviously have beers with the other team. And there was like boat races and some of my best, honestly, some of my best memories, it was like, what a way to see a country and learn a language where you get three weeks on, one week off and you're just travelling around to all these remote towns playing rugby. And yeah, it was unbelievable. Amen. I've got a packet of mates that have ended up in Federal One National now and they absolutely love it. Yeah. Like it's the best rugby since they've gone from university, academy, then the sort of stress of high level, top 14 premiership or URC rugby, international rugby. A lot of them have ended up there and they're having the time of their lives. It's a swan song as well at the end where it's proper fun. Um, this is the I, thing. It's like it's, there's life and there's rugby. And exactly. You in, even with top 14, like you have to tone it down. And you, so with the Prem, obviously, you focus so much and you, you get sucked into the world. Like you, you have a bad game on the weekend and you start 
right, what can I do better next week? And then you sort of, you get last week out of your head, but then it's Friday and then you've got to play tomorrow. And, and it's like Fed One was just two years where I was still training hard and trying to be the best player I could be, but just memories for days and off field stuff, just all the time we were doing fun stuff. So yeah, unbelievable, unbelievable league. Johnny, you're not that old. You got three kids at home to get away from. You're talking it up. You come out of retirement for it? There's still absolutely time. not. <laughs> There's absolutely not time. There's yeah. absolutely. If you'd see the shape of me, I'm a melted wheelie bin. There's no, they wouldn't even have me. Like, Wait, there's no the chance. That is the definition of bed one. It's just a load of <laughs> I'd give it a while. If I could, if I could call a line out and then stand on the touchline, maybe. Um, mate, I wanted to ask you. Like you, you mentioned them, um, Gabin Villiers. Um, I don't know if he was already converted to wing back then. I think he was a scrum half at some points as well at Fed One. So, as a bloke and also as a player, what was he like back then? And did you always see the potential in him then, or were you surprised by his rise that he's had over the past two, three seasons? I think people would be probably surprised about me and Wilfred and him in that in that league. Um, but he he was a scrum half when I first got there. First preseason I got there as a scrum half, and what he had was outrageous athletic ability, as we've seen and a mad work ethic. The man just works and he's also the best bloke you can meet. I still FaceTime him actually now and he's one of the reasons I can speak French. Like he really helped me obviously. I'm English lad arriving, I didn't even know how to say hello. Like it was, um, and he's just a hell of a bloke. He was a scrum half and I think, I, I, I don't know who made the decision to put him on the wing. It must have, it was either Richard Hill or he decided to move himself. But then that season he moved on the wing and he's, cause he was playing for like the second team and then he sort of moved into our first team. And, um, I think he scored something like 24 tries in, we didn't play that many games. He scored four tries in one game and it was just like, right, this guy's obviously got a talent. And then he got picked up by the French team, uh, the, the sevens team for that. And after that, it, honestly, if he was progressing like that, the, the sevens team just took, he got player of the tournament in maybe Dubai or one of them tournaments. Um, and after that, it was just like on his way to the top. Like, you can't tackle him. Like he's just, a, he's the slipperiest character in, but a hell of a bloke off the pitch as well. So yeah, great. Happy for him. And you got there, you said in pre-season, he was still a scrum half then. He was sort of maybe converted shortly after that, but you're a 10. Did you see in him, like you said, athletic ability, but sort of, you're not, you're, your passes are all over the place. I'm catching them up here, down there. Did you see, you know, you, you're, you're obviously not taking credit for his move to the wing, but did you see that, that he just wasn't suited to that? I think everyone sort of, I think everyone saw that, even he saw that. And I think you put the ball in his hands and he runs through everyone or you ask him to sort of manage a game at nine and he it obviously wasn't confident doing it. So I think it was a no-brainer. But what's mad actually is because his pass was terrible. He wouldn't mind me saying that. His pass was rubbish. And now I watch him on international stage and sometimes he's fixing boys and throwing these passes and stuff. So testament to how hard he's worked. He's worked incredibly hard and he's got the athletic ability. But to add on top of that, the his little kicks and all this sort of stuff. He's obviously, he's, he deserves everything that he's, he's getting right now. You mentioned you FaceTime him. You, he obviously helped you to speak French. How's his English? Is he going to come on the podcast or not? You can ask him. He does. I actually don't really remember. Obviously, I speak to him in French now, but he, I think his English is pretty good, actually. I think when you first get to France and you don't speak any French, like, it's such broken English. It's just like, hey, mate, are you, you go to gym? And then you're like, yeah, I go with you. And then, but, um, no, I spoke to him before I signed in top 14, actually. I spoke to him, I had a FaceTime with him and sort of told him what was going on in England and da, da, da. And he said, mate, he was like, because I wanted to know, everyone has this view of the top 14 with sort of bright eyes and all that. And I wanted to really hear it from him. And he said, mate, you'll love it out here. And he was right. And you're obviously with him. You said he's a tremendous bloke off the field as well. You still keep in touch. But back then, Federal won, initiations, read Ben Mercer's book as well. So I've got snippets. But there's a lot of stories around La Chouffe, which is a, a Belgian beer that floats around here. I was wondering if you could give us a little bit of insight into the initiations <laughs> and the stories that you had at Rouen with La Chouffe, which is a strong ass beer. It's like 8% and it's killed me a few times. The infamous Chouffe socials. We've obviously, Merce wrote this in his book and it's haunted me ever since. We, um, we had a playoff game. Some of the lads had drank some, drank some Chouffe over the, the start of the season. And then we had a playoff game in the first year, like big game, and obviously in Fed One, you play on the Sunday. And on the Thursday, it was one of the lads' 30th birthdays. And we were like, right, we can't not do anything. So we'll go out, we'll have one beer. Probably a bit naive at the time. <laughs> one one <laughs> beer. Yeah. Who goes out and has one beer? So Come on. I was, I was young, I was naive. And then we said, right, we'll go out, we'll have one beer and we'll go home. 
and we went out to this bar that sells the shoe from tap um and we had one the boys were oh we'll get a shoe we'll get a shoe and then we had one we ended up having two had three and all we had is three shoes and boys were pretty pissed but nothing nothing to write home about and then one of the lads i won't name names but he's like sick i'll describe him he's like <laughs> six foot seven big second row i've been on holidays with him we've been to oktoberfest we've been places and i know he can drink he can put away a lot of beer and he started to get like he was like really really drunk and then within like a 20 minute period he got really bad and he couldn't hold his head up and he basically passed out it started to get worse and worse so we were like right this is actually really serious we're gonna have to take him to hospital so we bundled him in the back of a car drove him to hospital me and ben mercer actually and then got him into the hospital he's lying in the hospital bed with a bucket by his head and we're sort of like looking after him and he's got the, he's got the nurses around him and stuff and then both of mine and Mercy's phones ping at the same time. And we get a text and it's Richard Hill. And it's a text saying, this message is going out to all my English players. I've heard that you guys are out on the town tonight. I sincerely hope, I've still got the text as well. I sincerely hope this isn't true. And we've got a big playoff game on Sunday, like Richard. And I'm looking at my phone, looking at this text and I'm looking to my left, seeing our starting second row in a hospital. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, right, this is bad. So bottom line, he, so sort of they said they're not going to pump his stomach. They're just going to look after him, whatever. He's got to stay overnight. So we stayed overnight and we all managed to make it to gym in the morning on time. Even the guy that had basically died from shoe got into the gym and the S&C coach was a legend. He said, I know what you boys have done. Just go in the side room, do some stretching, whatever. And we ended up winning the game on the Sunday. And then for the rest of the year, we sort of, the running joke was like the shoe from where like, it's going to take its next victim. Da, da, da. And we, we said, right, before the end of the year, before everyone goes their separate ways because people were signing elsewhere we'll go back to the same bar and we'll do we call it shoe <laughs> we call it shoe for the final shoe thing and we were like we'll all sit and we'll wear funny shirts and whatever and we'll go one for one on shoes so eventually end of the season we went we're all wearing stupid shirts like we all sit around the table there's like eight of us we order eight shoes and the server puts the eight shoes on the table and i've never seen a group of grown men more scared to have a beer <laughs> We're all looking around like, right, someone's going to be a victim tonight. We don't know who. And we sort of, we went one, went two, taking it slow. We're all chatting like someone's going to die. We don't know who it is. And then we got, like, we did like, I think our sixth shoe. And then I obviously straight out of uni, I'm 21 years old. Cocky is whatever. And I just, I was like, these shoes aren't touching us. Like, we're absolutely fine. And I downed it and woke up the next morning. Like, that's it. I just, I had no idea what happened. Woke up the next morning. It turns out I was the victim. And I've like looked at my phone and there's like the most incriminating photos of me of all time, like throwing up, doing all sorts. And I think the night turned into anarchy. There was like a South Africa, one of the big Safa lads was found, passed out on the bridge. And two lads actually, I'll shout them out, Joe Elliott and Harry Spencer, they got to the infamous 10 shoes each. Um, and then since then, shoes just followed me around my career. Like I went to Never in pre-season, sat in a bar. And the barman came over and said, oh, I heard your story about the shoofs in Rouen. And he gave me that little shoof gnome that it comes with and gave me these shoof hats. And then at Leicester, one of the fans after the game was like, we'll go for a shoof one time. And I was like, it's, so it's, just, it's basically just followed me. But yeah, anyone listening, don't try and drink too many shoofs. Especially not 10, mate, the 8%. Honestly, t the two lads that, obviously I don't remember, I made it to six and that was sayonara, <laughs> but... These two lads, it's verified, they both drank 10 shoes. And if a six foot seven second row is hospitalised after a few, we were talking about him before, Gabon Villiers, he's not a big lad. What was he like on the shoe for? Did he, he swear this? To be fair, the shoe thing was like a foreigner thing. It was all the English lads. Um, but I mean, Too sensible. He's, Gabon's in the international team. I probably shouldn't say too much, but the man can, <laughs> the man can have a few drinks, yeah. So you mentioned you took Shoof to Never, or she followed you to Never, whichever one it was. Followed me. It was a level up from Rouen. So yeah. how different was it? It was very different, to be fair. It was, Never is such a professional setup. Like, even boys in top 14 know that I think it's, it can be more professional than some of the, some of the top 14 setups. Honestly, it's, it's a small town. It's a population of 30,000, and you get eight, 9,000 at the stadium every week, making noise, going crazy, and amazing training ground honestly the training ground was better than Leicester's um I mean obviously the training at Leicester and everything was, was way better but the actual training ground the facility itself in a pro d2 team was unbelievable we had cryo chamber and all sorts and um I noticed the difference of like it this is it, the intensity went up 
Um, training was harder. But once again, it's still four weeks on, one week off. So you sort of had that. That's what was new to me at Leicester and, and Poe is that like you've got to stay in the battle. for. You might have 10 games in a row, 12 games in a row where you just don't get, you get one day off a week and you're not going to go see your family. You're not going to go to Madrid for the weekend. You're not going to do fun stuff. You've just got to, you've got to be rugby through and through. Probably too, no matter how hard it got, however sore you were, you would you know that in a few weeks' time you're off for a week. So even in my year with Bayonne when we were down in Prodi Do, we soon figured out that the Navarre boys were flying everywhere by private jet. Yeah. <laughs> we were like, what has gone on here? It's like the Bayonne, you're in the southwest corner. Everywhere is a 13 hour bus trip effectively in the in the in the Prodi Do league. Like you go to Oyonnax, you go to Navarre, but when we went for a walk around, like you said, Navarre, the infrastructure in the club, I could not believe it. Right. Like, again, a part of the world that's unknown, like the president that's there now is making it known for the rugby side because they've been terrific for the past eight, nine, ten seasons and they're growing year on year as well. But again, it must have been a phenomenal place to play. And some of the players you had were terrific as well. Mate, it was, un- it was an unbelievable experience. I look back and it's like, no one's heard of Never, And then all of a sudden this rugby team's there. We were top of Pro D2 for my first six months there and we... Funny, you talk about the private jets and stuff, but we um we got when I first got there, we got this new bus, and I think it cost a million euros, which is like more than a budget of a championship club. Do you know what I mean? And it was this unbelievable bus, all the chairs like fully reclined, duvets, kitchen. And I say, mate, what can it? What's a bus do for a million euros? <laughs> like, what is this bus doing? This is the most French thing ever. Is the first time we drove it. We're driving down the motorway at like eighty miles an hour, and the back window fell out. <laughs> like it smashed it, <laughs> it smashed on we still me and the boys still talk about it. this could have killed like if there was like a scooter behind that's game over and we're in a lawsuit I'm not talking to you right now I'm in court and we're like it smashed all over the floor and we had to do the rest of the journey with no back window but yeah the budget was insane the president's like the nicest guy ever legend um and yeah we had like Zach, I was living with Zach Guilford for a bit he's obviously played all blacks he's come to Nevada we had like Tongan Proct, we had David Lolla here, we had Frank Bradshaw who's just signed at Ulster now, we had Connor Trainer who was playing for Canada in the Olympics, we had boys that are coming from all over the spot, so um, it was it was an unbelievable experience, honestly, and like you said, the setup, the training around the stadium, it's like, you're in this tiny town, there's barely even, like, there's like two coffee shops and one bar, and then there's just this stadium, and yeah, it was unbelievable. And the medical care, you said there was <laughs> one point there where you tore your hamstring, and they offered you some alternative treatment, which I find quite entertaining. Mate, this is, of all the stories I've got in France, this one is the most, it, I'm still angry to this day and I'm not a very angry person. Like, But um, I rolled my ankle and it wasn't too bad, like typical sprain. It was like, I was meant to have like four weeks out and obviously as they do in, well, in sport in general, they try to bring me back too soon. So I came back and I hadn't really done any S&C or anything. Ended up tearing my hamstring and went for a scan and on the scan, it literally shows hamstring tear. No, like, Nothing up for dispute, I've got a hamstring tear. It's like one of the easiest things to rehab ever. You do a bit of rehab, you do your running, you come back on the pitch. And the coach, he used to get quite like annoyed with injuries, like quite annoyed about it. But it's like, it's part of rugby. I don't know why you'd be shocked when people get injured. But he said, right, he took me in for a meeting the day after I got my scan. And he said, I'm sending you to see someone. And I said, okay, is it a physio? And he said, sort of. And I said, what do you mean sort of? And he said, don't worry, it's going to fix your hamstring. And I said, all right, but and I was very clear to say, like, because I'd heard stories, I was like, I will go and see this person if it's going to help my hamstring. Is it a physio? And he was like, trust me, it's going to help your hamstring. I was like, you sure? He was like, yes. He was like, very clear on that. So he gives me the address, tells me what I'm doing. And I drive three hours the next day to, like, honestly, the back end of nowhere. I didn't see a building for, like, 45 minutes. I was just driving through the French countryside. And I finally got to this address, got there at, like, nine in the morning, left at, like, six in the morning, got there at, like, nine in the morning knocked on the door, spoke to this woman, and it became clear so quickly that this was not a physio. And she like puts me on this table. I even, looking back on it, I'm like, this is actually crazy, but she put me on this table and for two, two and a half hours, she didn't touch me at all, like no massage, nothing. It was just like, her hands were like hovering above me. And there was this like spiritual music on and stuff. And she said to me at the start, she's like, if you don't believe it all, if you don't believe it's gonna help you, it won't. So for the first 20 minutes or so, I was like, in my head. <laughs> crossing your fingers. I was there. Just oh, like, it's right, definitely going to work now. This is it. I was like trying to be like open-minded and be like, right, some, come on, this could be open-minded. Anything could happen. And she's like m- making noises and sort of putting her hands over me and like almost trying to like fix it with some magic or whatever. Um, 
And then the boys, the Mavel boys always refer to it as the saucepans, but they weren't saucepans. We've got these, like two metal plates out and he's like clanging them above me and like making me repeat stuff in French. I didn't even know what I was saying. Like, it was it was mad. And obviously all this time in my head, I'm just planning the speech I'm going to give to the coach. I'm like, someone's getting the red <laughs> ticket. Um, it went on for about three hours and I was just getting so frustrated. And then sat up I thought we were done and she said right there's one last thing to do she was like do you feel better and I didn't want to be rude so I was like yeah yeah feeling good but like my hamstring's still killing me but uh, let's go sprinting let's go and test it come yeah, on wait this is it's funny you say that so then she said like obviously I have my car she had hers and she was like right you've got to follow me so we drove out 20 minutes into the sticks um just like into this forest and bearing in mind I've got a torn hamstring I'm like get out of the car I'm like climbing fences walking across this terrain that's like this going up an incline and she's like trying to talk to me and I'm obviously just like seeing red. I'm just like planning how I'm going to get out of this contract, basically, like losing my head. And then uh, we get to this, like, it was gorgeous, like French countryside. And she like made me put my hand in this river and like rub it on my hamstring and like, like repeat things after her. And then like, she was like, right, this is what we've been looking for. And it was this like special tree. I don't know if it had like religious connotations or like spiritual or whatever, but we found this like tree. And she was like, I had to put my hand on it and repeat stuff. And it was like talking about how, this tree has been like, it's grounded, it has been grounded for so long that it grounds us into the floor and gives us health and stuff. And I sort of repeated this stuff. And then by now I'm just like in my head, I'm, I'm almost laughing. I'm like, this is carnage. My hamstring hurts even more now than it did yesterday. And then I like, basically finished with her. So thank you very much. Had to pay her as well, which I was livid about. <laughs> and, then, uh, <laughs> and then got back in the car and just called the coach and just like gave him both barrels, lost my head. And I ended up flying back to England. Like I just, I said to him, I'm getting treatment in England. I flew back to England, got treatment in England and came back when my hammy was all right. And then I've still got a really good relationship with that with him actually. And we spoke afterwards and we we put it to bed and he apologised and stuff. But I couldn't believe that I'm I'm signing for Leicester Tigers. Like I'm going to the premiership. I see myself as a pro athlete. I've got a torn hamstring. All I need is three weeks of rehab. And I've got this woman banging these metal plates above my head. <laughs> she need to hug. You just need to hug some trees, mate. Come on, we all need to every now and again. That's effectively what I did. I had like my hand on this tree. I was like, oh, it's got like, rock bottom here. It was unbelievable. And and Zach, after that glowing recommendation, if anyone's out there with a hamstring injury, how much does she charge? I think it was like 60 euros for the day. I was good. I, it's all yeah, right. Not bad. Too not much, bad. mate. <laughs> but it made 60 hamstring... euros too much. Yeah, but it, had, it made my hamstring worse. So <laughs> I love the fact that, obviously, I don't know anyone in that line of work, but I love the fact that her opening gambit was, oh, if you don't believe, it's not going to work. So it's almost like you get out before you've even started. It's your fault. Your fault. Like. <laughs> and the thing <laughs> is, is, like you said, like if I knew what I was going to, it wouldn't be the It was the fact I was like sure that I'm going to a physio to fix my hamstring and then I had to deal with it. Oh, it was just like, it was such a, a classic French experience, I guess. Classic. I mean, another thing that I'd heard again through the grapevine is that you'd actually in order to improve your kicking whilst in France as a youngster you watched YouTube clips and tutorials to improve yourself and then when you got to Leicester there was actually a kicking coach that was a bit of a culture shock is that true? Yeah that's true I am um, because that's what I was sort of saying earlier is these boys had had everyone's had like epic coaches boys that have been in academies or with England they, most of those people have been with either England South Africa whoever their 18s, 20s and all that. And they've learned how to do all this stuff. And I had like a good left boot because I played football and sort of was always kicking when I was young and stuff. But technically there were certain positions on the pitch where I'd just get charged down or couldn't like get the ball at a certain angle. So I'd just watch YouTube videos when I was in Rouen. And I had a guy called Luke Cousins actually who helped me quite a lot. And I just, he's same at Nevera. I was like watching YouTube on how to get the ball to do certain things. And then, so when I got to Leicester, it was actually Mike Ford took like kicking sessions and, spent like a lot of time on the pitch and it was clear that like those boys just knew exactly what they were doing at all times. And I'd just been sort of scaling, Googling like how to spiral it or how to do this. And I guess it worked, but yeah, it's a bit, bit of an unorthodox way to learn to kick. And there's obviously pros and cons. You've spoken passionately about the fact that you love it in France. It suits you very well. Do you get asked a lot by other sort of English players, what it's like in France, if it's a good idea, how you go about approaching clubs and sort of seeing if they might be interested? Mate, honestly, it's one of the, it, I get contacted so frequently about it. Actually, my brother, between me and my brother, obviously, when, like rugby's a small world, we know quite a lot of people. And I got, he literally texted me the other day and said, oh, there's a lad in the championship who wants to speak to you. Is that all right? And I honestly think about once a month, if not more, someone from England will like either 
text me or message me on Instagram or one of these things and say like, but it's different. It is honestly different now. When I first got in, the amount of foreigners in the top 14 for the, that Montpellier team, when I first got to France, was just all South Africans. And now they've obviously brought the GIF thing in and at all levels. I don't actually know what the rules are in Fed One now, but the fact that you could have like eight, nine foreigners easily and whatever, whereas they are trying to obviously, and it's, it's paying off with the national team, but it's a lot harder for foreigners to get into France. So I'd, I give the best advice I can on speaking French, helping out and da, 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 but I, I did get in at a good time. There is a lot more demand that is weird. So the places are fewer than they've ever been, but the demand, especially look across the water, the premiership, they've just re reduced that salary cap again. Yeah. The amount of players that are going to have to leave this season is phenomenal. And I bumped into three props in Bayonne this weekend, all English-based premiership boys that said there aren't any contracts. So everybody is going to be signing in France this summer if they can. Otherwise, there's actually a real worry of where people end up in England at the minute because the salary cap has been bumped down again, down to 5 million, I think it is. Yeah. And that's that's nothing com compared to what, if, you, if you're looking at like a, even a Glasgow Warriors or a Leinster or a, like that's not like the English premiership sides are going to be less for the first time in a long time than everyone else in the British and Irish Isles. So the pressure on these guys to find clubs and to play at the best level possible traditionally would have said, move over to France but my worry is I don't think there's going to be enough spots for them now um, but more than ever I'm the same as you more phone calls than I've ever had people yeah. trying to get over and especially people in premiership this year so my hope is that they all find teams and they find clubs but my worry is there's going to be quite a few people that fall through the cracks this year and I'm not sure where they're going to end up it's bizarre 100%. and even like when I first got to Pro D2 it's, so Pro D2 is unbelievable I think it's such a good league and it's always competitive but now I'm looking at people in Pro D2 who are like we're playing international rugby a year ago or we're playing in yep. pro 14, top 14 or top, like the Prem. And it's just like, you're, you're almost getting this, you're, the second division of French rugby is strengthening so much because it's the pro D2 and the top 14, they vote as a group of um, whatever that is, 30 teams. And they're very collective and they're big on growing the sport and all this. And I fear that obviously in England with the, the, the death of the championship and stuff like this, that with the recent vote to obviously not allow Ealing to, come up and stuff like this it's almost French rugby's going that way and I don't know where English domestic rugby's going and I get asked a lot if I'd come back and play and I'd definitely come back and play in the premiership and like even though I speak so positively of France and stuff that's still been 90% of my 20s away from my family away from my friends I've missed a lot and there's that side of it as well so playing in England isn't something I'd say no to but at the moment I don't see how life-wise I could make that decision with sort of what's happening with the game at the moment. And obviously, given what you've both said there, there might be fewer cases of Englishmen playing in France, but at the very top level, obviously there's one high profile at the moment that people are talking about in Zach Mercer at Montpellier, who's tearing it up in the top 14. Before him, there was Stefan Armitage. Given your experiences, what do you make of that rule that is still in place in England in terms of the fact that obviously there's exceptional circumstances, but generally... If you play in the top 14, you're not allowed to play for England. Would you change that? Do you know what? It's probably an unpopular opinion, but I can completely see why it's the rule. Because like we said, why would some of the, some of these England boys, obviously, I've spoke, like there's a few of them that I've spoken to that I played with or whatever. And it's like, realistically, if you could play for England and also play for Racing or play on the beach and down in Biarritz or whatever, why would you stay and, and live in sort of, just life, I forget rugby for a second, but you can live in Worcester or you can live in the south of France on the beach. Do you know what I mean? Or those sorts of things. So I can completely see why it's in place. It's, it's annoying for these boys, of course, but for the game, we're already talking about how the game's struggling and things like the championship. It's like, for me, it's probably, it's, it's probably a bit of a no-brainer for the RFU to keep that rule in place because you'd lose half your players. And you've been here for a long time. You've absorbed a lot of the culture. You've got a lot of French friends. Any part of you feel French? Honestly, it's I. It's weird. I actually do, and um, I get my mates at home. So, like I said, my mates at home—they're not rugby boys, and they don't care that I play pro rugby. If anything, it goes against me when we're in the pub or whatever. And um, they, because do you know, like, if I've been in France for say six months, my initial response in my head would be to answer something in French, or the word would come in my head in French. So when I'm back home, I might slip up and accidentally say a French word or something, and everyone's like. Mate, we get it. You speak French. Like, shut your mouth. Like, we don't Especially care. after a few shoes, eh? Hey? Yeah, well, exactly. After <laughs> half a shoe. Um, so, but I honestly do. There's certain times where 
Like, I do miss England at times. Obviously, I grew up there and stuff, but it does. Yeah, there's there's certain parts of me that does feel a bit French or feels very comfortable sort of in a shop or down the road or speaking to someone in the street and stuff like that. And then it can be a bit of a shock going back to England. Um, so, yeah, there is there is a little part of me, but obviously I'm still fully English. And just quickly, you mentioned the, the in your words, I don't want to quote you, but the, the death of the championship. We know there's so many issues there. You mentioned your brother played there and taught you what not to do in terms of um, going to the championship. People often compare because they're the second tiers in both countries, the championship and, and pro did a, obviously massive differences that you can't just flick a switch and, and bring pro did a, to England. But is there anything from sort of being over there that you think that we could really in England learn from that in terms of trying to build the championship rather than sort of um, what we've seen happen to it recently? Honestly, mate, in, I've got mates that play in the championship. Obviously my brother, I went and watched a lot of games when I was back and forth. And then obviously I play, played in Pro D2. The, there's almost not a similarity. Like you've, other, I don't know about the level because I think the championship rugby as a standard is, is good rugby. I don't, there's no reason to say otherwise, but like from the stadiums to the investment, to the fans, to the pitches, to the TV rights, to the signings, to the, how they do their social medias, to how they market it. I'm just like, this is a completely different thing. They just like, and the, I think the other thing is the support. Actually, I'm not too educated. I'm not too, I don't know too much on if premiership teams support championship teams. I don't, I know that top 14 teams fully support pro D2 teams. And even, I think I read an article recently where it was like the, even when a year ago, Breathe were in the relegation battle, they still voted to have relegate because they do a vote, don't they? If we should have relegation or not, they still voted yes to relegation because for the great, the greater good of the sport, it's the best thing to do. And I think there's so much movement between players, between top 14, Pro D2 and Fed 1. It's not seen as a someone plays for Pro D2, you're not like, oh, they play in Pro D2. It's like, oh, it's just another high-level team that isn't quite in the top 14. Whereas I know with the, how the Prem sees the champ, it's very different. And coaches, I don't think premiership coaches are necessarily going to have confidence in a championship player to come in and do a job straight away for a Prem team. Whereas Pro D2 players are diving into top 14 teams all the time and top 14 players diving into Pro D2 teams all the time and it's just it's open between the two leagues do you know what I mean and there's a lot more movement and a lot more confidence so it's chalk and cheese honestly I've, I've seen the difference and it's like you said it's not something you can flick a switch on it would take a, a lot of time to to build it up to, to where the Pro D2 is. And back to the present you're at Poe now you're playing alongside another fly half in Antoine Hustoy who is making some waves he's been around the front squad He's off to play under Ronan Angara at La Rochelle next season. So how good is he? He's so good. <laughs> He's, you never know what to expect when you sign for a club and you sort of, I'm not a massive, I don't watch a massive amount of rugby. I don't sort of, so I just got here and trained alongside him and he's, he's, high quality. Like he's, he's almost unlucky in the fact, I mean, he's got a lot of time, but the fact that Intermac is obviously just occupying that 10 shirt for France and you can't argue with that, the, the, the bloke's quality, but he honestly has everything. He's, he's a 10 who defends well. His kicking is quality. His attacking game's mad. And he can play 10 and fullback. We, sometimes I'm at 10. Sometimes he's at fullback. Sometimes he's at, full, he's at 10. I'm at fullback. And he's honestly a real, real good talent. And as I, as I say, most importantly, real good bloke off the pitch. And we get on really well. And so when I'm at 15, he's at 10. We have little chats and talk about how we can sort of have the best game possible. And if I'm, at, I'm goal kicking or he's goal kicking, we talk about it openly. So... Brilliant bloke, but honestly, massive talent. And I think going to La Rochelle, he'll, he'll be the starting 10 at La Rochelle with O'Gara, with that team, with that forward pack. I think sky's the limit, really. He's, he's, he's going to go a long way. And we haven't seen any announcements for Paul bringing anyone else. So is that a big vote of confidence in you for next season? Has anything been said? I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about that. Um, but I'm here next year and I, I know I'll be, I'll be playing some 10. So I, I don't know what I can say. <laughs> Maybe some 15? I'd, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> we, we're building up that you're filling that shirt, but it sounds like you might have some competition. <laughs> I have no idea. Other news, you guys aiming for that top eight spot, looking to confirm European rugby. The news this week is that South African sides will be joining European rugby next year, so they'll be joining the Champions Cup. What are your thoughts on squaring off against the Stormers or the Cheetahs? or the Sharks in European rugby next year? How do you think that'll sit in within the French system? 
Well, I'll probably get back in the gym firstly because that is <laughs> that's some big boys. Some uh, built on. Yeah, um, and it it will be interesting because I think I don't like I say I don't watch too much rugby, so I don't know too much on how the the Safa teams play. But if it's anything like the national team, obviously the, the French teams lack structure, um, which is it's a great thing because you see the amount of amazing tries we score on things that just came out of nowhere. But also, if a team can put in place a really good structure against you, then it can it can go against you. So it'll be interesting to see what sort of strategy they bring. But physic. South African teams obviously traditionally are physical, but these top 14 teams now, everyone is, the physicality of this league is insane. So I'd like to think boys could probably match some of these Safa teams in terms of physicality. So it'll be it'll be an interesting one and interesting dynamic to add to it. See, my only concern is, say Poe, right, have got a crunch game against Breve that they need to win. Then, you know, the week after you're playing against Toulouse at home. In between that, you've got a group game away to the Stormers. So you, you could play a game maybe on a Sunday, the nine o'clock game. Then midweek, you've got to fly to South Africa to play an away game. Like realistically, what kind of side will French sides put out with a four-day turnaround to play against the Stormers? Or like that's my concern is that actually, the, I think that because everyone, the eggs all have to go in the top 14 basket, my worry is that the European rugby, if they add South African teams to it, They'll have to put out second sides because there's just no way you would send your first string after a big game like a smash up against like a cast or a Toulon or a, with important games afterwards. Yeah. That, that's my worries. I, I cannot see French sides and up to a certain extent the same with Premiership sides. It'll be different for URC because they've got no relegation. But for sides that are having a tough season, how are they going to compete? Again, already it's difficult now. But what will the attitude be if you've got a four day turnaround and you're going to play against? the Sharks in South Africa, I just like, that's my worry. I think it could be for commercial money. I, I'm not sure it's a vote for fans because realistically as well, how many people from Toulouse are going to fly to Durban? And yeah, take yeah. like, do you know what I mean? So like, it's not really, it's, it's a pure, for me, it looks like a money spinner, but. I mean, what's, what's interesting is obviously French teams, from my experience, don't care about Europe unless they're in with a shot. Um, and that's obviously what we see this year. It's like, I don't think it's a secret that we've we've probably not sent our best team out in the Challenge Cup because, firstly, top fourteen is so important to the fans, to for for cash for the presidents for the team. They value top fourteen so much, like bread they, and butter, bread and butter, and they like it means so much to them. But secondly, there's no easy game in top fourteen. I mean, every game, even if it's even if you win by forty points, like it's everything's so physical now. And like you said, I don't. I mean, I know Poe. And I know that if we've if we were in Europe and we've got a game against South Africa next week, they are not sending it with Stade Francais this week and Racing afterwards and so like one or two placement spots up for grabs. There's not a chance that they're sending they're, they're most likely to send like academy boys or like boys that are eligible but haven't had much game time, which is that brings its own form of danger. And it'll be interesting to see how it pans out. But yeah, I've I spoke about player welfare in England last year, and I think we all I mean. Money, money talks, doesn't it? So we'll see how it see how it pans out. I'm up for a trip to South Africa anyway. I was just about to say, Johnny, you make a very <laughs> valid point there, but Zach yeah. will be sticking his hand up for a shoof social in Cape Town, I guarantee you. <laughs> yes, a shoof in Durban. It tastes sweet down there. <laughs> well, thanks so much for coming on, Zach. Right, it's been, great for the, been great to hear the stories from Lower Down as well as the present day. Um, whether it's a shoof social in South Africa or just an end of the season one, maybe you can come back on next season and we'll hear all about it. I'll give, we'll have a we'll have a podcast over a few shoots and we'll see who survives. Sign me up. <laughs> Sounds good, mate. Best luck this weekend as well, Zach. Cheers, mate. Bye. Very interesting that from the third tier to the second tier to the top tier. Yeah, there's not many people that have done each of those levels and done them really well. I actually played against Zach when he was at Never, um, and he was terrific there, like really handy player. So. It was absolutely no surprise when he got picked up by Leicester um, and I was delighted to see him come back to Poe um, and he's been playing well when he's been on form and fit. Um, he's been fantastic. So it was great to have him on. Um, great to get a little bit of insight, some of the older school stories that we we still have. Um, and yeah, a great, great boy as well. So fantastic to see him doing well and hope they kick on this weekend. They can still make the top eight so they might knock Toulon off that spot. We'll see. And sounds like we'll be hearing in the next few weeks, who his competition might be in the tension next season. <laughs> he was very, very coy. Uh, I'm not sure if I can talk about that. Um, <laughs> well, clearly somebody's coming in. Um, and I'd imagine as well, actually, their team has been very, very 
smart with their recruitment. If you look through, again, the way Poe was two, three, four years ago with your Conrad Smiths, um, Carl Heyman's, there was big name signings, but actually now there aren't that many superstars. So I'll be really interested to see who they do bring in um, and what profile they go for. Because as you mentioned, the coach they've got in who was so successful with the 20s and won World Cups um, is under the radar. He's not flashy. He's just simple systems, a good bloke. So really intrigued to see who they bring in um, to fill that spot left by Hastoy. Really interesting hearing about Zach's progression from Federal Alain, Pro de Deux, now top 14 with a bit of premiership in between. One man going in the other direction at the end of his career, friend of the show, Stefan Armitage, has announced he's going back to his boyhood club in Nice from Biarritz, isn't he? Yeah, which is amazing. Um, and look, his, his game time's kind of been winding down a little bit with Biarritz, but for him to go back to where he grew up with his brothers, um, and again, he was part of that club when he was eight years old, so to go back and help them with their project, again, Nice are co-owned by Scottish Rugby, by Stade Francais, who have the controlling stake as well. There's an exciting project. Again, Zach talked about the installations and the quality of infrastructure at Nevers. Nice is outstanding as well. So they're going in the right direction. And Steph, like big friend of the show and a good mate, um, it'd be great to see him getting down there, getting his sleeves rolled up. Again, I'd imagine that'd be part playing part coaching or management eventually. Um, and I'm sure he'll make it a success. He'll be, he'll be looking forward to getting back to Nice as well because I know how much he loves that part of the world. And one other piece of really big news before we go, the Spanish Federation have released this, but they obviously qualified, made huge headlines. Great to see another nation doing well in the World Cup in France in 2023. The rug has been pulled from under them, hasn't it? Well, it sounds like they shot themselves in the foot again. This isn't the, yeah. I mean, this is exactly what happened for the last World Cup cycle. Yes, they progressed. Yes, they moved on. Um, the player pool has actually gotten much better as well. You actually see a lot of French people, a lot of French players, sorry, um, down there playing for the Spanish side. Again, two of my ex-teammates, so John, John Zabalza, tight head prop, played at Bayonne. Uh, fantastic big bloke. Again, delighted for him or was delighted that he was going to his first World Cup. Guillaume Rouet as well, who's my scrum half at Bayon. But the same same mistake. Uh, again, a different type of error, but Gavin van der Berg. And again, you look at the games in which he was registered, in which he played. He played two games. They pumped Holland 52-7 and 43-0. But the fact that he's been on the team sheet twice and he hasn't completed the proper residency platforms as a South African means everything's been thrown in there and they're going to get thrown out again. So... It's hugely disappointing. And for Guillaume, like he said in the paper this morning, like we just can't learn from our same, it's the same mistake since the people that run the show, they're destroying this for everybody. Um, and he's absolutely devastated as you, as you would imagine. So hugely disappointing for Spain. Um, you want to see them evolving. You want to see them involved, which they were about to be, unfortunately, no more. It's a real shame. And I said the rug's been pulled from under them. As you rightly point out, it's their own administrative error, potentially the player himself, potentially... Yeah the administrators at the union in Spain. Realistically, this isn't a very good look for rugby, is it? A team qualified, we want to grow the game, we want new countries to be um, rising up the ranks, and now they're not going to be there. So should this be sort of allowed to happen? Well, I think there is due process. I mean, there's a very simple process for player registration. There's simple guidelines for qualification. Everybody knows the rules. The Federation, the Spanish Federation is actually pointing the finger back at the player and saying that it was him that incorrectly filled things in and therefore it's his fault. But either way, it's a really stupid and simplistic way to lose your place at a World Cup and what that would have meant financially for their Federation, what it would have meant for the development and, and the, the confidence and the, the belief in the sport in that country, um, it would have been absolutely massive. So Again, who, whose fault? It doesn't really matter. It, it just makes it look a little bit amateurish. But that's unfortunately what Guillaume has said. It's, it's the same people that are there in charge, a different type of mistake. But again, a clerical paper error has ultimately resulted in them missing a second World Cup. So massively disappointing. I, I've got two or three mates that are concerned. Um, hugely disappointing for them. Um, but I think generally for the development of the growth of the game in Spain, um, massive disappointment. Thanks, Johnny. A big thanks to Zach Henry for joining us. And thanks to all you guys for listening as well. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review if you can as well. Check us out on Rugby Pass as well as on YouTube. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Johnny. Cheers, Tim.
Fall.